Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Robert Fowler. I'm the president of the Humanic Society, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome you here this evening to the Society Lecture, and in particular, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Professor Douglas Cairns, who is professor of Greek at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, Douglas is one of the most distinguished Hellenists in the country. Uh, he has published widely on uh, topics in Greek literature, from Homer through uh, lyric poetry, through tragedy. Uh, he has also published on many aspects of uh, Greek society. Uh, he uh, is the author of uh, Eidos, which is a, a, a standard reference, a classic work uh, on that concept in, in ancient Greek society and literature. And more recently, he's produced a, an authoritative uh, commentary on uh, five odes of uh, Bacillides. Uh, he has been uh, much in demand around the world. He has held uh, posts uh, from one side to the other, mm -hmm. in the Antipodes, uh, to, to our island. And um, he has had visiting professorships in uh, Japan and the United States. He's been a Humboldt Fellow uh, and spent, I think, three years in total in, in, in Germany. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and in addition, he has been a, a great uh, member of the profession in terms of his, his service, Douglas and I first got to know each other when we served together for some years on the Classical Association Council. Uh, we're back together again now on the Hellenic Society Council, and Douglas also at the moment is uh, chair of the Council of the Classical Association of Scotland. Um, in recognition of his academic achievements, last year he was elected as a fellow of the Academia Europaea, which is a very great distinction. Uh, his uh, research program for the last few years has been in the area of uh, ancient Greek emotions, uh, how they were experienced um, by uh, people in, in society, but also represented in literature. Uh, he's um, uh, given us several publications already, and there's a, a, a large uh, program of research underway in that uh, regard. And it is from that uh, project that uh, tonight's lecture is drawn. I was uh, interested to see that last year he wrote an article entitled A Brief History of Shuddering. A Short History of Shudders. A short History of Shudders, yeah. okay. <laughs> and tonight <laughs> we're going to hear uh, a little bit more about this, uh, uh, the horror and the pity, 3K, as a tragic emotion. Thanks very much. Thanks very much indeed, Bob. Um, it's uh, a great pleasure to be involved in the Hellenic Society and a great honour to be invited to give its, its lecture this evening. A uh, great organisation, one that I'm very proud to be associated with. Um, so, without further ado, I'll start. Um, I'm going to start with a passage in Sophocles' Oedipus the King. Just before the passage that I've put as number one on the handout, um, the chorus sing a song the fourth stasimon. And this is the song which represents their reaction to the, the divulgation of what Oedipus has done. So in the fourth stasimon, the chorus reflect on the status of their king as a paradigm of the instability of human happiness. The point being that if even someone like Oedipus, the saviour of his city, can rise so high only to fall so low, then any of us, anyone whatsoever is vulnerable. So that's the chorus's reaction. Oedipus's reaction, of course, as we know, is to blind himself. And he then appears again on stage, and that then prompts passage number one on the handout, a further reaction from the chorus. So the chorus are still, as they were in their previous song, horrified by um, what has happened to Oedipus, and they remain fundamentally sympathetic to Oedipus in his suffering, but his physical appearance makes a difference. The sight of the horrible mutilation that Oedipus has inflicted on himself, which will have been represented by the new mask that the actor will have put on before re-emerging from the stage building onto the stage, this elicits a new and more physical response, a response that the chorus call frike in the last line there if you want to read it in Greek. Um, such is the frike that you cause in me. Frike is shivering or shuddering. We'll say that for the moment. This response of frike springs from a fascination 
that the chorus have with the spectacle that Oedipus now represents, but it also uh, entails an instinctive revulsion towards that spectacle. Oedipus, in some sense, is here an object, but he's also an object of pity. He's a human being like the chorus members themselves. They respond to the sight of Oedipus, but it's not just the sight of Oedipus that's important, and it's not just the sight of Oedipus that excites the chorus's revulsion. They can't bear to look at him, but equally at the beginning of the passage, they sing, O dein on e dein pathos anthropois, a terrible pathos, a terrible suffering for human beings to see. The whole thing is terrible to look at, as well as the sight of Oedipus himself. It's not just the self-blinding, it's the whole catastrophe of which the self-blinding is the latest, most physical and most visible expression that is terrible for humans to see. What I'm going to focus on in this lecture is the specific nature of this thing, frike, that the chorus experience here. Clearly this is a response with a strong perceptual element, because it's above all the sight of Oedipus in his present condition that triggers it. It's a spontaneous and instinctive reaction, but it's not just a reflex reaction, because its thought content also includes the chorus's attempt to encompass the sheer magnitude of Oedipus' suffering, together with the causes of that suffering, and especially whatever superhuman or supernatural forces may lie behind it. So there are sensory aspects, but there are also cognitive aspects. But these sensory and cognitive aspects, though they may be essential for the specification of the emotion in these particular circumstances, are not enough to make Frike what it is because Frike is fundamentally a physical experience. It's the experience of a body that shivers and shudders. So in this passage, Frike is first a spontaneous response to a shocking visual stimulus. Second, it's an interpretation of a particular state of affairs in terms of specific evaluative norms. And thirdly, it's a corporeal experience. It's something that the body feels. So the eyes for perception, the mind for cognition, and the body for a, a fundamental physical somatic experience are all implicated. The chorus look, they think, and they shudder. Simply calling their response freaky goes a long way towards specifying and recreating what it feels like to have this response, what I'm going to call its phenomenology. So because of the, the reference to Frike, we get a sense of what it's like to be moved as the chorus is moved by Oedipus. Whether we see the play ourselves in the theatre or recreate it in our mind's eye as we read it, the response of this internal audience is in some sense a guide to our own. As I'll say in a minute, Frike can be the name of an emotion, but primarily it's a physical symptom that's common to a range of events, some of which are emotional and some of which are not. In this primary sense, with reference to a physical sensation, Frike belongs to the basic somatic level of emotion. The medical and scientific sources that I've given you under number two on the handout give plenty of evidence of this basic somatic aspect of Frike. And these sources are pretty much unanimous in relating Frike and the words that belong with it to bodily temperature. We shudder when we're cold, fundamentally. And when we shudder or shiver in other circumstances, in these writers, and I think in fact, variations in bodily temperature are normally also implicated. For Galen, somewhere in the middle of number two on the handout, very small print which I can't see in the dark, but maybe you can see it. For Galen, Frike affects only the skin. Whereas Rigos, Rigos is the word that's cognate with the Latin word frigos, affects the whole body. And this illustrates a link, this uh, specification of frike as a, an event on the skin provides a cue for comment on the occurrence of frike in non-human animals, number four on the handout. And for human beings, number three on the handout, frike in this sense is a vestigial response, it's a trace of human beings' pre-human past. It's goose pimples, it's the hair standing on end, or as I'm going to call it, pillow erection. 
So free care is an involuntary bodily movement. It's part of human beings' pre-human inheritance. It's rooted in basic symptoms of bodily regulation that respond to changes in the temperature of the organism and of the environment. As a symptom of emotion, and especially of fear-like emotions, and things like horror too, this is recognised in our own folk and scientific models of emotion. We talk about cold sweats, we talk about the hair standing and end, we talk about shuddering to think, and so on. Um, under number five in the handout, I've given you some scientific evidence for that. And if you look at the end of uh, number five on the handout, you have references to recent studies that correlate the metaphorical um, use of this language, hot and cold, with the physical um, temperature of, of human beings. So, for example, if you give a, a set of experimental subjects a cup of coffee and then show them into the experimental room and ask them to evaluate the behaviour of some stooge who's performing a scenario for their benefit, the ones who are holding the coffee feel warmer towards the, the people who are carrying out the scenario than those who are not holding anything at all or who are holding something cold. This is a label, as I've said, for a physical symptom. But in Greek, as in English, these words are not restricted to the label of physical symptoms. It's typical for the physical symptom to be used as a metonym, as a name, for the emotion with which it's associated. And there's a lot of passages that would illustrate this um, with reference to freaky in Greek. But we see the phenomenon of metonymy most clearly when the verb to shudder, or to shiver, frisain, has a direct object in the same way as would a verb meaning to fear. The Greeks say, friso this, I shudder this. We translate it, I shudder at this, but it has a direct object in the same way as the verb to fear does. And the way that the verb frisain in ways of speaking like this can stand for a verb of fearing, or something like that, is especially clear in the one passage I've given you under number six on the handout from Euripides Hippolytus, where Phaedra expresses her inability to imagine how an adulteress would be able to conceal her gu guilty conscience from her husband. She says, how can they look their husbands in the face and not frisane, not shudder at the darkness, their partner in crime, or the timbers of the house, lest they at some stage speak? The fact here that frisane is followed not only by a direct object, but also by a noun clause of the sort that regularly specifies the propositional content of a verb of fearing, indicates that shudder here means more than shuddering. It's a metonymy for an emotion, something like fear, because shudders as such don't have any propositional content. In the last paragraph or so, I've been summarising the article which is in the bibliography under my name that was published last year in a volume edited by Angelos Caniotis and Pierre Ducre, the short history of Shudders one that uh, Bob mentioned earlier on. In that article, I tried to discuss at length, in a fairly general way, what this phenomenon of taking the symptom and using it as a name for the emotion means for our understanding of the conceptualization of emotional experience in the broadest sense. And the basic point I make there, I'm not going to summarize the whole article, but the basic point I make is that the importance of emotional symptoms in the construction of emotion concepts underlines the fundamental importance of physical embodiment in the concept of emotion itself. The experiential embodied nature of emotion isn't just something that belongs to a shared biological substratum, something that all human beings experience in an identical way and something that may go back to human beings' pre-human inheritance. The experiential embodied nature of emotion is also a feature of language and it's also a feature of thought. So there is, or at least there can be, a continuity between emotions as physical experiences and emotional concepts as linguistic and cultural categories. The way that a figure of thought, in this case metonymy, can turn the physical symptom into a way of referring to the emotion itself allows us to see something of the phenomenology, the what it feels like of emotion. It gets us as close as we can get to the cultures and the languages attempt to encapsulate subjective, embodied emotional experience in language, in the intersubjective medium of language. <laughs>
A fundamental aspect of this phenomenology in the case of Frike is its regular association with automatic instinctive responses to loud noises and sudden sights. So immediate visual or auditory stimuli. Number seven on the handout. In the Oedipus passage that we started with, the chorus's sudden shock at being confronted by the sight of their once revered king, now horribly mutilated, is fully in keeping with these connotations of Frike. But Frike's associations with unexpected or unsettling visual stimuli also make it especially appropriate to particular forms of visual appearance, namely epiphany, quasi-epiphany, or other presumed signs of divine presence. That's number eight on the handout. And there's an excellent article there by Walter Burkert um, called Horror Stories, which is about what the Germans would call their Heiliger Schauder, the shudder which is especially associated with religious experience. And this is another relevant aspect of our passage, because in that passage, the chorus's questions, accompanied by their frike, focus specifically on the daimonic origins of Oedipus's sufferings. So they're confronted by a sight that they find horrible, but they're also convinced that that sight has supernatural divine causes. Though Frike can in these ways be associated with the, institutionals, the institutions, rituals and scenarios that are deeply embedded in Greek cultural norms, it still retains its basic rootedness in the body and its sensations, specifying this immediate, instinctive and occurrent form of emotional experience. It's uh, an emotion which is in the moment. It's not a dispositional emo uh, emotion. It's always about something that's occurrent, something that's happening, something that you actually feel. And it's precisely, I guess, in order to retain connotations of this sort, to conjure up something of the experience of emotion rather than simply labeling it, that language uses metonyms of this sort in the first place. And so, when Sophocles' chorus refer to the frike that Oedipus occasions in them, they're referring to an involuntary physical response. This is the kind of thing you'd feel if you were very cold. It's a response that's allied to feelings of fear and revulsion, occasioned on the one hand by the sudden and shocking sight of Oedipus's physical mutilation, but also by the chorus's reflections on actions which are at once the most heinous of transgressions, and also the most shocking indication of human vulnerability to suffering. That suffering is now compounded by a horrific act of self-mutilation, which the chorus assume must be divinely inspired, as were the parricide and incest that preceded it. Precisely because their response and their description of that response conveys such a pronounced sense of its phenomenology, audiences, ancient and modern, get a more vivid and immediate understanding of what it might be like to be in their shoes. Some of the issues that this passage raises are addressed in Aristotle's Poetics, number nine on the handout. So here we have a characteristic passage of the important chapter 14 on the best type of tragic plot. And Aristotle reflects on the importance of plot construction as against visual spectacle. This passage contains the only occurrence of the word frike or anything like it, in the Poetics. And the evidence we've uh, looked at would suggest that Aristotle chooses the verb fritein rather than, for example, the verb phobesthai, which is his regular um, term for the, the emotion in question, precisely because the topic is the relative power of spectacle. Because the idea that frike can produce spectacle is something that Aristotle takes for granted as uncontroversial. But he wants to insist that even this quintessentially instinctive response to immediate and unexpected visual stimuli can be better produced by means of the plot without performance. Um, the effect can be um, aroused without actually seeing the play in the theatre. And his example is the OT, in which spectacle does in fact play an important role in the chorus's frique in the scene that we've discussed. Probably as a practitioner, Sophocles might have wanted to insist on the interaction of plot and spectacle to a greater extent than Aristotle does. But the choruses, and by extension the audience's response in the OT, is clearly not just a response to special effects, special visual effects. 
It depends on a reflective evaluation of a structured series of actions that does indeed, in many respects, correspond to the pattern that's recommended by Aristotle in this chapter of the Poetics and in the Poetics in general. But Aristotle wasn't the first to give Freaky a role in Poetics. The Sicilian philosopher and rhetorician Gorgias had already expressed uh, what are in some ways rather similar ideas in his Encomium of Helen. Part of Gorgias's case there involves the argument that persuasive speech is irresistible. And the prime example that he gives of persuasive speech is poetry. This is number 10 on the handout. Like Aristotle, Gorgias is concerned with an audience's emotional engagement with the changing fortunes of others, their sufferings, the change from good to bad fortune. His core emotional responses are the same as Aristotle's, their pity and fear. And he emphasises the power of these emotions with references to physical symptoms and expressions. He talks about tears and he talks about freaking. There's only one explicit detail in which Gorgias differs from Aristotle. He differs from Aristotle by emphasising also the compulsive emotional power of opsis, but also the compulsive emotional power of logos. So sections 15 to 19 of his speech are about how opsis is irresistible, and sections 8 to 14 are about how logos is irresistible. And it emerges that both of these things, what you see and what you hear, persuade in similar ways. Gorgias says, as the speech of astronomers persuades by making, quotation, what's incredible and obscure, apparent to the eyes of opinion, in section 13, so opsis, quotation again, engraves images of the objects of vision on the mind, in section 17. So you have mental images both when you see and when you hear. This is a difference of emphasis, but it does take us back to Aristotle's basic point. Both seeing and hearing involve the formation of mental images, and so this is how Aristotle can say that poetic speech alone, without opsis, is perfectly capable of arousing in the hearer the kind of emotion that opsis might arouse in a spectator. And in fact, both Gorgias and Aristotle are drawing on the implicit poetics of earlier pre-dramatic Greek poetry. In the Homeric poems, as I'm sure everybody knows, song is presented as, as something that derives from, or at least resembles, eyewitness knowledge. You see the, the derivation of song from eyewitness knowledge in the passage from Iliad 2 in number 11 on the handout, and you see the resemblance of song to eyewitness knowledge in the passage from Odyssey 8, in number 11 on the handout. In that second passage in Odyssey 8, Homer's Demodocus wasn't present at Troy, and he neither witnessed the events that he narrates, nor did he hear about them from someone who did. But someone who was present, namely Odysseus, is able to offer a unique guarantee of the bard's powers of representation. The way that both audiences and authors reveled in these capacities is demonstrated by the pervasive um, tradition of ekphrasis, the vivid quasi-pictorial representation of a scene, a person, an animal, or an object, not just a work of art, that already appears as a deliberate tour de force in the Shield of Achilles in Iliad 18. The capacity that allows a reader or a hearer to form mental images from a verbal narrative, the Greeks called phantasia, and we call imagination. The counterpart of fantasia in the text and in the repertoire of skills that create texts is energeia, sometimes also called emphasis or saphenia, vividness. The Gorgias and Aristotle stand for us at the beginning of a tradition of Greek literary aesthetics as a formal discipline. The tradition in which they themselves exist is already one that makes no absolute distinction between the effects of dramatic performance versus narrative representation. Although ancient Greek authors regularly comment on the greater power and persuasiveness of what we see with our own eyes by comparison with what we only hear about, it seems to have been an ideal of Greek narrative to efface that distinction as much as possible. In both cases, 
our powers of fantasia are engaged. In both cases, the response of an audience or reader is typically emotional. And in both cases, the emotional response in question may have a pronounced somatic aspect that underlines the continuity between narrative or dramatic representation and the emotion eliciting scenarios of everyday life. And this I find interesting because in all these ways, what the Greeks are talking about in their literary and aesthetic and rhetorical theory um, can be regarded as early contributions to current debate. Current debate on a range of interesting and related issues, such as the central position of imagination among the cognitive capacities to which verbal and visual narratives appeal, or the continuity between the cognitive and effective capacities that are enlisted by narratives and those that serve us in our everyday lives, or the similarity between verbal and visual narratives, such as film, in the way that they exploit these cognitive and affective capacities. And finally, we're dealing also with the role of the body in the affective responses of audiences. If you look at some of the psychological and philosophical literature, which is in the bibliography at the end of the handout, you see that people at the cutting edge of debate right now are discussing these issues in very, much, very similar terms to the way that they arise in ancient Greek theory. The fantasia that's engaged by the energeia of ancient Greek narratives takes a wide range of forms, both in theory and in practice. But as I said a, mo a moment ago, its effects are typically emotional. We feel, in response to these narratives, uh, something like what a participant or an eyewitness would feel. In Plato's dialogue, the Ion, the rhapsode of the same name, eagerly expresses his assent to Socrates' suggestion in 535b to c that those who perform the Homeric poems are subject to a divinely inspired form of ecstasy analogous to that of the inspired poet himself that allows them to enter into the events that they narrate. This is number 12 on the handout. The term freaky isn't used in this passage, but Ion does refer to the fact that when he's telling the performing, reciting, the Homeric poems, his hair stands on end. And so freaky is what I think his pillow erection points to. Ion himself makes no distinction between narrative and direct speech. But to the extent that the experiences he describes are experiences of the characters portrayed in the poems that he performs, the substantial proportion of the Homeric texts that's character speech is not an irrelevant consideration. In his delivery of both narrative and character speech, Ion will be both narrator and performer. In both these capacities, his recitation involves an element of identification with the poem's characters in their emotional reactions to the events narrated. In a real sense, the physical presence of the performer helps to suggest the physicality of the emotions of the characters. Now, clearly, characters in a narrative can and do feel pity for others and fear for themselves in the narrative. But these responses, especially pity, are already in Plato's day the characteristic emotional responses of audiences, as the Gorgias passage already indicates. And so, accordingly, the physical experiences and emotional reactions that Ion has are also the physical experiences and emotional reactions of an audience. We're still in number 12 on the handout at 535 DTE. And so there are several tensions in this passage from Plato. Ion is a narrator of the actions of others, but also, especially when he's performing character speech, something like an actor, engaging in direct representation of the story's characters. At the same time, Ion himself embodies aspects of an audience's reaction to the doings and sufferings of the characters. The audience's reaction mirrors his, but this raises an important question. So, to borrow terms from Keith Oatley, is this way that the audience feel the same as Ion? Is this, a, is this an empathetic response, to use Oatley's terms? Does it involve feeling with the characters? Do the audience identify emotionally with the characters? Does the response recreate, at least to some extent, a first-person perspective 
Or is it perhaps, on the other hand, a sympathetic response, a third-person reaction involving feeling for rather than feeling with, in which the audience, is, the audience experiences distinct emotions of its own, elicited by, but not identical to, the emotions of the characters. So this is the issue I want to focus on for the, the rest of the paper. Again, it's a big issue in contemporary debate. A striking incident in Josephus' narrative of Rome's Jewish wars raises these issues. This is number 13 on the handout, a long quotation from William Whiston's rather archaic translation of Josephus. I've highlighted the, import the important passages for you in bold there. So it's during the siege of Jerusalem, and a starving woman called Mary cooks and eats her own son in a desperate attempt to avenge herself upon the Jewish guards who've been stealing her food and therefore have reduced her to starvation and desperation to the extent that she cooks and eats her own son. The guards then smell the, the cooking, they come back, they see what she's done, and they're transfixed with horror, freaky, at the sight. They see it and they experience this immediate freaky. So they're eyewitnesses. But as the news spreads through the city, all those who hear about it also visualise it. They shudder at the event, and again the word is frike. They shudder at the event as if they had committed it themselves, in section 213 there. So these internal auditors recreate the act in their mind's eye. Their powers of fantasia, imagination, give the event a vividness that elicits the same kind of spontaneous involuntary and physical response as was experienced by the people who actually did witness it. The reaction of the eyewitnesses is one of horror and revulsion, but the secondary audience, in some sense, imagines something of what it would be like to do such a thing. There's still revulsion, but the suggestion of putting oneself in the place of the perpetrator, in the place of Mary, facilitates another response a possible response of sympathy. And accordingly, when the news reaches the Romans, though some of them are incredulous and many of them are filled with even greater loathing for the Jews than they had hitherto felt, other Romans feel pity in section 214. The wider narrative of this event in Josephus concentrates on the extremes of suffering to which human beings can be reduced. It presents Mary herself as a victim of other people's greed and cruelty, and it makes her cannibal feast a protest against their inhumanity. In this way, the imaginative identification with Mary that's attributed to those who first hear the report of her deed, and the pity that's the response of at least some of the Romans, these act as cues for the responses that Josephus and his artfully created narrative are trying to arouse in us, the readers. The reader's emotions are guided first of all by the vividness of the narrative itself, then by the responses of internal eyewitnesses, then by two distinct sets of internal auditors. In this case, though the internal audience's picturing of themselves in the agent's shoes has a strong emotional component, this doesn't involve feeling what the agent felt. It involves recreating the agent's point of view as part of a third-person response to the act. All the emotional responses that are adumbrated in this passage, whether horror, revulsion, hatred or pity, they're all third-person onlookers' responses, and so is our hypothetical sympathy as a reading audience. It's a commonplace, and it's correct too, to emphasise the influence of the theatre and especially of tragedy, on passages like this one from Josephus. But the vivid presentation of action and emotion, as if before the eyes of a listening or reading public, is an absolute staple of Greek poetics and rhetoric from their very beginnings. Similarly, the centrality of pity as an audience response to serious poetry is implicit in the poetics of the Iliad and explicit in the earliest formulations of Greek philosophical poetics. 
The ability to feel this pity, according to Aristotle in the rhetoric, depends on a sense of the vulnerability that we share with those who are suffering. That's number 14 on the handout. Similarly self-referential is the fear that in both the poetics and the rhetoric is said to derive from the sense that things like this might conceivably happen to us. Shared vulnerability to vicissitude is a condition for pity, both in traditional Greek ethics and in the implicit, implicit aesthetics of poetic texts. The Locus Classicus is right at the very beginning, the highlight of the earliest work of Greek literature itself, the encounter of Achilles and Priam in Iliad 24, the parable of the jars of Zeus. Among several salient and authoritative statements of the same principle in tragedy, especially Sophoclean tragedy, perhaps Odysseus's reflections on the madness and degradation of his enemy, Ajax, are the most memorable, still number 14 on the handout. Similarly, in the Oedipus the King, the pity that the chorus and others feel, despite their revulsion for Oedipus, complements the chorus's authoritative presentation in the fourth stasimon of Oedipus's career as a paradigm of the shared human vulnerability on which pity rests. And so the chorus's response is crucial in guiding and conditioning the response of an external audience. The same seems to me to be true of their freaky in that passage that we started with. The chorus's horror at Oedipus's suffering is a prerequisite for the recognition that his suffering differs in degree, but not in kind, from the sort of thing that might happen to any of us. This use of freaky, of a response that's both sympathetic and fearful, can be traced also in other tragic passages, number 15 on the handout. In the Trachinii, for example, the leader of the female chorus uses the term freaky to describe her response to the sufferings of Heracles in the poison shirt of Nessus. So too in the Prometheus Bound, still in number 15 on the handout, the female chorus, in expressing their sympathy for the persecuted cow maiden Io, um, used the term freaky. The movements and gestures that accompanied Io's opening words when she first appeared on stage at 561 and following will have made it clear to internal and external audiences alike that she's suffering from intense physical torment. In the ensuing scene, and especially in the narrative of Io's persecution, Io emphasizes her sufferings and presents herself as an appropriate recipient of pity. Pity as a response that she says she wants and she expects, 684 to 5. The leader of the chorus has invited Io to tell the story of her sufferings because the chorus leader wanted the pleasure, she says, at 631 to 4, of a full report of what's happened to Io. One of the things that the audience raised when I gave this paper on Tuesday in Nottingham is that we get from a sequence that begins with pleasure to something that ends in a very different way, as we'll see in a second. So they request the pleasure, in some sense, of a report. And then Prometheus encourages Io to comply on the grounds that it will be good for her too. Prometheus says, 638-9, to to weep away and lament one's misfortunes is worth the effort when one is likely to win a tear from listeners. So there's a lot of cues here, and all these cues are priming the audience to see the chorus's response to Io as sympathetic. And the audience is not disappointed. The chorus do recognise the extremity of Io's situation, and they do sympathise with it. But the sympathy that's explicit, uh, sorry, implicit in their recognition of Io's distress is also mixed with distress on the part of the chorus themselves. As with the chorus in the OT, the sufferings of another person both compel their attention, but they also overwhelm them, so that they can hardly bear to contemplate the other person's pain. In this passage, understanding of another's emotional distress produces self-focused anxiety, more obviously than other concern. There is a degree of pity, but there's also more obviously fear. They go from requesting the pleasure of a, a report that they think may move them to finding it too moving, too distressing. In both these examples that I've just mentioned from the Trachinii and the Prometheus Bound, 
Heracles and Io are on stage. The chorus in question respond to sufferings that are presented before their eyes and that are compounded by the lamentations and by the body language, by the performance of the actor who uh, uh, represents the patience of these sufferings. But we can have similar responses, and these can be attributed to characters within a verbal narrative as well as characters visually um, present on stage. And we see this in two passages of Plutarch's Life of Emilius Paulus, number 16 on the handout. The Homeric theme of the mutability of fortune is central to this life, the life of Emilius Paulus, and to the pair that that life forms with the life of Timoleon. The specific debt to Homer in the Emilius, in particular, is advertised at the very emotional climax of the work in chapters 34 to 35, where Plutarch narrates the reversal that struck Emilius at the very pinnacle of his success. Emilius Paulus is the conqueror of Perseus, the last king of Macedonia, the last in the long line of Alexander's successors. But the triumph in which this crucial stage of Rome's rise to dominance in the world is celebrated is undercut by the death of two of the general's sons, one aged 14, five days before the triumph, and the other aged 12, three days after it. For the narrator, this is the work of a demonic force, that force, whatever it may be, whose business it is to ensure that no one's life should be unsullied or without admixture of trouble. And that's a quotation, or a paraphrase of a quotation from Homer. It's a reference to the passage of the Jars of Zeus in Iliad 24. For the Roman people, on the other hand, the vulnerability of all human beings to, to suffering, to vicissitude, to alteration that this demonstrates is occasion for freaky. The quotation, all shudder at the cruelty of fortune, that she didn't scruple to introduce so much sorrow into a household so admired, so full of joy and sacrifices, or to mix laments and tears together with victory paeans and triumphs. In each of these cases, the dramatic cases that I discussed a moment ago and the narrative ones in Plutarch, Frique responds to the misfortunes of others. It unites both the fearful sense that we ourselves are as vulnerable as they are and the sympathy that derives from that very recognition. This union of fear for ourselves and sympathy for others, together with the central focus of these emotions on the mutability of fortune, clearly echoes some of the central tenets of Aristotle's theory in the Poetics, and this shows how widespread these assumptions are in Greek literary culture. In each of these cases, too, we have an internal audience it's experiencing an emotional reaction with all the phenomenological connotations of Frique that I've been discussing in this paper. This is a reaction that's clearly meant to stand in some relation to the potential responses of the external audience. Internal and external audiences, in some sense, feel the same emotion. But it doesn't seem to be true to suggest that the external audience is catching the frique of the internal audience through emotional con contagion. And it's not true to say either that the internal frique causes the external frique. Because the things that cause the internal frique, the frique of an internal audience, are in every way sufficient in themselves to cause the freak of the external audience. And the emotional response of the internal audience is not the focus of the emotional response of the external audience. The external audience is not feeling with, not empathizing with the internal one. It's not imaginatively simulating or reconstructing their first person response. These are third person, onlookers responses in every case. The external audience replicates the response of the internal audience, but each of them remains the response of an audience to the emotional plight of a third party. Insofar as the emotions of internal and external audiences are the same, this is a matter of their converging on the same object, even though the response of the internal audience clearly does act, in some sense, to prime or prepare for the um, response of the external audience. In this respect, the reaction of a character or a chorus in tragedy, or the point of view of a character in a purely verbal narrative, 
operate in a sense like the point of view or reaction shot in cinema. The eliciting conditions um, for the relevant emotional responses are contextually established. We know that a pram tumbling down the Odessa steps is a bad thing, even without seeing the reactions of the spectators to the, tram, the pram trundling down the Odessa steps. But still, the official expressions of the onlookers um, prime and steer the audience's reaction to these eliciting conditions. They don't trust us to do it by ourselves. They give us the primary responses. The frique of an internal audience in tragedy or a narrative is like that, I think. It's a reflection in the text itself of the text relation to an audience. References to internal audiences frique offer a perspective on the emotion eliciting power of the text itself. I've been talking a bit about empathy um, and I've come to think that I don't really believe in empathy. That doesn't mean I'm a psychopath, it's just that I think we use the, the word empathy in ordinary everyday senses to mean the same as sympathy. But if we use it in the strict sense in which it was first introduced to the English language as a translation of the, 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 the German Einfühlung, which involves imaginatively recreating another person's thought processes or another person's emotional experiences, then I don't think we really ever do that. If empathy does require that kind of thing, adopting another person's first-person perspective or experiencing from their point of view, from their first-person perspective, the emotions that they feel, then the external audiences of ancient Greek dramas and narratives don't empathize with the internal figures whose point of view helps to steer their responses. The internal viewer feels frique, and the external audience may feel frique, but their frique isn't a matter of their identifying with or being affected by the emotional reaction of an internal focalizer. Nor is the ideal response of an external audience typically represented as empathy with the focal characters whose suffering excites the frique of both internal and external audiences. Although there's regularly an element of generalization that extrapolates from the suffering of the character to the kind of thing that might happen to anyone, and though audiences might adopt a view of the sufferer as a human being like themselves, still the character's experience differs from the experience of their audiences, internal or external. The characters are suffering. Choruses, focalizing characters, and external audiences don't feel what they are feeling, they feel precisely what Gorgias so well puts, so well says, a certain experience of their own. They, we don't feel anguish, grief, remorse or shame, what the characters feel. We feel fear, pity or freaky, and so do internal audiences. To be sure, characters in a, a drama or a narrative can be afraid. They can shiver or they can shudder and the audience may do this along with them. But this is not the type of response that's considered characteristic of poetic audiences. And when frique appears as an aesthetic emotion, it's typically an observer's response, not a vicarious first-person response. It's not Oedipus's frique that elicits the frique of the chorus or the audience. And even those who, in the narrative from Josephus that we discussed, those who imaginatively recreate uh, Mary's cannibal feast before their eyes as if they themselves were the perpetrators, they nonetheless react to that event in a way in which Mary herself did not. As Stephen Halliwell puts it in The Aesthetics of Mimesis, page 216, quotation, when we feel pity, we do not share the sufferer's subjectivity, however much we may draw emotionally near to it or move vicariously with its psychological expression. We remain qua feelers of pity outside the immediate first-person reality of the pain, whether physical or mental. And I think that's right. This is a significant fact about ancient Greek aesthetic and poetic theory. Contemporary approaches have much to say also about sympathetic responses of this sort. It's typical for contemporary approaches to these questions to emphasize the potential for identificatory or empathetic responses of various sorts. Contemporary approaches um, feel to a much greater extent that we simulate the experiences of other people to the extent that we get a, a, a first person or a quasi-first person 
window onto them. They do this much more than ancient Greek texts ever do. Ancient Greek texts make no great claims about feeling what other people feel. Okay, I'm nearly done. Frike is by no means ubiquitous as a tragic emotion, but when it does occur in that connection, it's informative about the nature of tragic emotions. Though it's typically a symptom of fear, horror, or revulsion, it can be an expression of the link between those emotions and the shared sense of vulnerability that gives rise to pity. Frike's nature as an involuntary response, especially to immediate visual and or oral stimuli, together with its fundamentally physical somatic character, help us to put some phenomenological flesh upon the bare bones of pity and fear as the typical tragic emotions. The immediacy of Frike in turn, and especially its association with the visual, can serve to illustrate the premium placed on vividness and visuality by authors, consumers and theorists of ancient Greek narratives. And so it also illustrates the continuity between narrative genres on the one hand and dramatic genres on the other hand as objects of ancient literary theory. Though actors as well as observers can experience frike as a response to the terrifying or the horrific, what we might call tragic frike tracks the tragic emotions of pity and fear as characteristically third-person observer's responses to suffering. And so it corroborates the general emphasis of ancient Greek aesthetics on sympathy in the strict sense, over empathy in the strict sense, on feeling for rather than feeling with. But although in this way and in lots of others too, the concept of frike is deeply enmeshed in the cultural specifics of ancient Greek societies, frike nonetheless possesses a core that cannot be relativized. It has a rootedness in the physicality of human emotion and an origin in human beings pre-human biological inheritance. When the chorus expresses their frike at Oedipus's self-blinding, we know what they mean. And this is the difference that frike's phenomenal, phenomenological richness can make. Even if such a full-bodied somatic response, and this is debatable, but even if it's much less frequent in our own emotional repertoire as readers, theatre-goers or cinema-goers, or if we find our frissons in different places these days, in different forms of art, still we all know what it's like to shudder or to shiver. And because of this, we can approach, at least to some degree, something of the characteristic emotional tone at which ancient authors were aiming. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. That was a terrific paper. I'm sure there are questions. I hope so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> While people are, are formulating, I might seize the opportunity mm -hmm. to, to ask about that. Yep. It's about the pleasure that people get from yeah. watching horror. Okay? Yeah. Legions of horror fans mm -hmm. these days keep going back because they derive some sort yeah. of pleasure yeah. from it. Uh, you perhaps know Tony Nuttall's book, uh, Why Was Tragedy Yeah. Yeah. Pleasure? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, very interesting exploration of that question. I was wondering uh, if, if there were any Greek texts which commented on that. And at that very moment, we came to handout number 10. Mm -hmm. um, and there it is. So yeah. I had a sort of shudder of delight. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's right, yeah. As I read about the, um, where is it, Pothos Philopentes. Yeah. Um, and, and I wonder if you can uh, point out any other passages or offer some thoughts on this general phenomenon. Mm -hmm. It also links to your exploration of the differences between external and internal yeah. audiences. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, if, if, if they're watching a real um, uh, horror of some kind, mm -hmm. and unless they're monsters, they're not going to feel mm -hmm. any pleasure in it. But yeah. we as spectators yeah. of, of a representation of a mimesis yeah. may, in, in a different way, yeah. uh, experience some, some pleasure from well, it comes up in Republic 10, doesn't it? It's a big, big topic there. And it's one of the things that Plato holds against poetry, that uh, you do have this paradoxical pleasure in going to, to share the, as he thinks, share the grief of, uh, of characters who are behaving in ways that, in which uh, people shouldn't behave um, in public. Um, but I think this goes, although it's not specifically about audience responses, it does go all the way back to the, the paradox of um, lamentation in, in the Hermetic poems, the idea that it's somehow pleasant 
to experience these emotions, even for those who are experiencing them from a, a first-person perspective. So I guess that it can it actually blurs the distinction I've been making between internal audiences and the the, the folk characters and their experiences and the experiences of, of external audiences. But that's, I think, what, what I would relate it to. And I think there are quite a few other examples. Gorgias is, is the big one. The passage from the Prometheus, Prometheus Bound is the same thing. The, the chorus of uh, Oceanids are, are pure observers of, of Io's plight, but they want the pleasure of a, nar a narrative which will explain to them why this person is jerking around like mad in the way that she is and, you know, looks like a cow. <laughs> And when they get it, they're overwhelmed by it. Um, there, I think there are lots more examples in Dana Montiano's book about um, whatever it's about uh, this kind of thing, tragic pleasures. Uh, well, I'm fascinating paper. Um, I'm getting lots of questions from us, but I wanted to ask one that goes back really to the beginning of the paper. Uh -huh. um, your, your, your text to sort of five. Yeah. Um, and I, I may have misremembered this, but did I get the, feel, the, the sense that um, you're saying, well, shuddering or free care yeah. is a physical reaction, yeah. a physical phenomenon, and um, not a psychological phenomenon as it's called? Uh, um, we use I think autonomous. I think it's the one before it's the other, yeah. Um, and I just wondered about that. I mean, yeah. um, because um, <coughs> the, there are these physical sensations that are, are um, as it were, essentially cognitive. Yeah. Like blushing. I mean, people yeah. don't blush unless they. Um, I mean, it's not, it's no, not that embarrassment yeah, brings that's it on. True. Yeah. It's, it's the blushing yeah. is all its various, yeah. so, uh, a, a reaction of um, embarrassment. Yeah, yeah, I think we're slightly at cross purposes. So um, I would argue and agree with you that um, even to experience, experience, to experience instinctive physical freaking at uh, a loud noise or something like that, or at the sight of a snake or whatever it is, that involves cognition too. It involves some kind of appraisal of the environment and some kind of um, sense of, of how it impacts on oneself in terms of the standard appraisal theory of emotion. And I think uh, the, the sort of, you know, the Joseph Ledoux um, idea of emotion, that it's actually the physical thing that happens first and then the cognition supervenes on that, I think that's, it's completely wrong. Um, so, um, and especially when we're talking about human beings, I think, we, we can never separate out that element of appraisal, evaluation and cognition. But what I was arguing wasn't that. So I wasn't saying that um, even physical freaky isn't a cognitive response of that sort. I think it is. I think any emotion that a human being feels is inevitably enmeshed in human beings' cognitive capacities. But what I was arguing was that that kind of response, cognitive though it may be, as an occurrent thing, is the origin of the, the purely um, metonymous or metaphorical use of the same locution. Um, that to say, well, Plutarch is a good example as well. He says to one of his interlocutors in one of the, the dialogues, um, don't you cover your head to say such a thing? Um, and no covering of the head actually takes place. So the covering of the head is a typical uh, expression of shame and therefore it can be used purely linguistically as a, a way of referring to the emotion itself. And that's what I say is going on in the case of, of, of Frike as well. It's used, for example, uh, in all kinds of passages, in the same way as we say, I shudder to think, where no actual shuddering takes place. It's a pure Sprachgeberde in that sense. It's a purely linguistic phenomenon. Um, and that non-physical, more abstract, less concrete sense comes from the physical and concrete sense, I think. That's the, the general direction of travel. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I'm not saying that it's... Shudders as such, when I said shudders as such have no, um, whatever it was, uh, propositional content, I think that's true of, of shudders that are occasioned by simple um, yeah. environmental Very temperature. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. So actually, shuddering shudders are a rather more complex phenomenon. Yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the blush is an interesting one as well, but it's used in the same way. So 
Um, you can talk about blushing, but no actual blushing takes place. as a way of talking about shame, which blushing yeah. stands for. Can it cause blushing in others? Um, I would have to see if there was any empirical evidence for that. I suspect there probably is. And that's a, an interesting point, because in one of the footnotes for the written version of, of this, um, which I'll have to try and bring out a bit more, I think, I deal with some uh, studies in psychology and film studies, which argue that um, the only work of art that can really produce this, the only art form that can really produce this idea of emotional contagion is film. Because on film you see, you know, 12 times the size of God on the screen, a big face, and you get its facial reaction. And therefore the audience can, in some sense, catch this emotion. And they say this with, with such enormous confidence, and I'm just not sure it's true, because I think something similar is going on there. It's, it's less a matter of emotional contagion, I think, in the Greek sources that I was talking about, but it is a matter of priming, which is a major psychological ph um, phenomenon. People behave in all kinds of ways if you prime them to behave in those ways, and priming is enormously important. Framing is, is enormously important as well, as you see in you know, Kahneman's recent and popular book. And there's evidence that that kind of thing does happen without visual um, representation as well. So, for example, Keith Oatley, the guy I, I cite in this paper, has done experiments in Toronto with um, people in his book group and people in his lab, and he gives them a pencil, and they, they take the pencil, and they put it in their teeth like that, and they read an emotion-arousing story, and some of them don't have the pencil, and they read the same emotion-arousing story, and the ones who have the pencil in their their teeth, report fewer emotional reactions to the story than the ones who don't. And he observes them in cameras and he slows it down and all the rest of it. He looks at, you know, the tracks, the eye movement and all this kind of thing. He looks at very, very minute facial reactions and those who don't have the pencil are in fact moving their faces in response to a novel, to a purely verbal narrative. So there is something in texts that's doing this kind of thing that film does as well, I think. And that's a really interesting thing to, to pursue. Going back to what you were saying about shuddering being different from um, the embarrassment factor of blushing. I mean, there are situations where human beings could actually react to things which they don't understand. Yeah. Um, where they usually say they, they have concerns. So uh -huh. they get gut feelings that something bad is going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that, I mean, that's very much the, the sort of neurophysiological approach to emotion and, in fact, to lots of types of cognition now, you know, even um, in some respects to decision. They say it's essentially happening before you know it's happening. Um, and there are people who would extrapolate, like uh, Michael Gazaniga, who would extrapolate from that to all cognitive experience whatsoever. They say that everything we think about it is an after-the-fact rationalization of, of what's really going on. And basically, there is no, you know, there's no Cartesian theater where we're actually observing what we're thinking. It's uh, happening all over the place, and only some of the time does it permeate to the surface. And when it does, we think of a reason for it. But that may not be the actual reason for it. I'm, I, I really am not convinced that that's uh, the case. It's clearly a phenomenon that, that, that does take place, and Gazaniga himself was able to track it by from his own work with split brain patients who actually have no communication between the two hemispheres of the brain. Um, but the rest of us don't have split brains. The rest of us um, respond normally to external states of affairs. And I'm not convinced that all our reasons are in fact rationalizations. I think it happens some of the time. Yeah, yeah. This is the yeah. rate in the ethics that in fact all ethical reasons. Yeah, is, is yeah, that that's right. It's yeah. just justifying your gut feeling. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. 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 But I mean, they do do it, um, and it, it's not. It wasn't the the beginning of cinema, you know. So when cinema started, it was like a play, and you know, the camera simply showed a proscenium stage basically and people interacted on stage and it didn't track there was no shot reverse shot 
thing at all. These things had to be uh, invented and brought in. And they're still there. So they're filling some kind of cognitive niche that must work with audiences. Otherwise, the films that, that use it wouldn't still be, still be doing it. Um, and the thing about Freaky is, um, I mean, basically, Freaky as an aesthetic emotion, this is it. There isn't much more than that. Um, so it's used very sparingly. It's not used um, particularly sparingly as a, as a, a concept. Um, in Plutarch in particular, it's all over the place. He uses it all the time. Um, in the medical writers, it's all over the place. But in tragedy, um, especially as a reaction of internal audiences in tragedy, it's relatively sparing. So I think probably that's the answer, that it's they don't overuse it and they don't ram it down your throat how you're supposed to be feeling in this, this situation. But they also don't think it's worth the risk of not priming the audience in any way whatsoever. From the Ion, mm -hmm. where Ion he, he feels free care at the story he's telling, so that's really a Woody Dark kind of third person perspective on this that he's, he's not. I think it's actually more, that's one of the passages that doesn't quite suit my case because it's much more ambivalent than that. I'm just wondering if there were any, um, any discussion or reference to how, rather than Rhapsode's actual actors yeah. feel. Um, in relation to their characters, I mean, is, yeah. is, is Fruit Hair ever ascribed to an actor or to the process of acting, or is that too... I mean, yeah. Would that make the actor too far removed from the events yeah. and make it less of an embodiment and more of a kind of watching? Um, well, I think if, a, if an actor did experience Fruit an audience wouldn't notice it in a, in a Greek theatre in the same way as they wouldn't, even if they did have the faces rather than masks, that they wouldn't see facial expressions. They see whatever facial expressions masks are able to suggest, and they are able to suggest some, but they have to be fairly broad brush, and they're normally accompanied by, by signs in the text. Um, but yeah, the Ion example is an interesting one because I think it's, it's, it's everything that I've been discussing, all rammed into one, you know, so he is, he's acting out the performance, the, the, the experiences of the characters, but he's also priming the responses of the audience. At one level, he's narrating the story. At the other level, he's acting in the story. And at another level, he's responding to the story as an audience might. So it's, it's over-determined in that, that sense. But the passage that is closest to, to what you're looking for, I think, is the, the famous anecdote about the act of Polis in performing um, Euripi, uh, Sophocles' Electra, where he takes the ashes of his, his dead child into the first into rehearsal and then into the theatre, to, to get, get the, the method, method acting response that he wants. But this is obviously something that his contemporaries and everyone since has thought was deeply weird, because we wouldn't have it as an anecdote if every Greek actor was a method actor. So I think probably they weren't. Just one more? Yeah, I got the rarity of usage is interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I was just wondering, any decent person in the Hellenistic period would have con connected this with Africa and said this is where nobody shudders or something uh -huh. like that. Um, but philologically, I mean, Prince Frico seemed to be yeah. interesting to me. Um, yeah. Prince uh, yeah. yeah. just on that point. I, well, I think it's cognate with the French frisson, definitely. Um, the grammarian says, the modern etymology says, it's not cognate with frigus or rigos. So they, lit, they, they group those two, but not frike. So it doesn't have an intrinsic reference to cold in the way that uh, Rigos does. Of course, I, I imagine the original thought came from the hedgehog. Well, exactly, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And yeah. not cognitive. Yeah, perhaps. yeah. So a lot of the um, passages, if you were to do a word search in Homer, actually involve um, a particular recurrent image of the, the army in battle, as though it's a single organic creature with its spears as the spines of the hedgehog, precisely. Well, that just a little I don't think we need to be holding long cups of coffee to be feeling well disposed <laughs> towards that wonderful lecture. Tremendous uh, uh, performance. Uh, uh, uh -huh. only, with only a little freaky on my part. <laughs> so let me invite you to uh, this for the understanding. Thank you.